Hello my friends, HM here. Now in this video we are going to take a deeper look at the spectacular attacks that Ukraine has carried out deep inside Russia and blown up basically billions of dollars worth of ammunition for Russia. It's going to get a lot worse for Russia and uh, I thought it would be interesting to speculate a little bit about the weapons that Ukraine has used here and also about the warheads that they're using in these weapons in order to penetrate these bunkers that stores the ammunition. So uh, if you think that sounds interesting, keep watching. Now, before we begin, I want to say thank you to the over 600 new subscribers that I've gotten since I dropped my last video. And also, as you can see, I've gotten now over 5,000 subscribers in total. That's amazing. 40 days ago, I only had 600 subscribers. So I think I've found the formula for how to make videos that interest you guys. I have to exploit my ability to go a little deeper and also provide some context for what's happening in this world. And that's what I'm going to do going forward. Also, if you like my video, don't forget to support my channel by giving it a like or subscribing to my channel. And if you really like my video, there are these three dots down here that you can press and then you can click this thanks button and then you can simply send me some money. I really urge you to do that because I found out that 90% now of my income is from these donations and I make like $100 from making one video, $90 is from donation, $10 is from subscription fees and stuff. Still, I got a comment that I was getting greedy, that I was bringing your attention to this donation bottom. I'm not being greedy. I spent like 50 hours making a video and all I get is like $100. That's $2 an hour. That's not greedy, I think. My opportunity cost is like 100 times that. So the more I make on this channel, the more time I can spend making videos, the more videos you will get. And I think it's funny to make these videos. It's more funny than my other stuff that I'm doing as a data analyst. So please help me support my channel. And with all that out of the way, let's get to it. Now the first attack that Ukraine did on a Russian ammunition dump happened a few days ago. And what you are seeing right there is the images from that attack. It happened at night, but it's still burning here at dawn and it looks like doomsday and it affects a very large area. It's not like an ammunition dump in a warehouse somewhere. No, this is like 10 square kilometers large area with many, many bunkers all over, like 200 bunkers filled with ammunition. There were 30,000 tons of ammunition stored in this facility. And I've seen video evidence from satellite pictures afterwards that shows that about two thirds of all the bunkers are destroyed. So with 30,000 tons were stored there, that's the official record of how much can be stored on this facility. But we also had satellite images before it was attacked and it showed that there were weapons flowing around and I'll show you those uh, satellite images. Weapons were stored also outside of the bunkers. So all Ukraine had to do really was to hit some of those weapons that were stored outside of the bunkers and then a chain reaction would, would start to happen. But it was not all parts of the ammunition dump that had ammunition outside of the bunkers. There were other parts of the ammunition store that had no ammunition stored outside and they were also destroyed like two thirds of those. How did Ukraine actually destroy those as well? Well, let's first take a look at the map where this took place and then dig a little bit more into it. Okay, so here we have a Google map of where this took place. It took place right here and uh, I'm sitting right here in Copenhagen. And here we have Poland, we have Belarus and we have Ukraine down here. And up here we have Russia, of course, and the Baltic states. So let's see how long that is away from Ukraine. I have another map to show that it's a deep state map here. So it took place right here, the attack. And Ukraine could have launched it from around here. And then I took a measurement to see how long away is it from Ukraine. It's 460 kilometers. Now we'll use that to figure out what kind of weapons they have used. So that's just a little tidbit of information we need to keep in mind. But I'll come back to that later. Now I'm going to show you a video that's probably the most important video that can gain some insight from what is happening right here at this attack. So here obviously we have an explosion that's the beginning of this video and we can see it's happening at night but the sky is lit up by this explosion. I do believe that this is the initial explosion that a Ukrainian drone successfully penetrated one of the big bunkers and a very large detonation is happening here. What I want you to notice is this mist that we can see right here. What is happening to this mist? Here we can see it. 
it's basically affecting the entire mist and you can see it's coming from the shock wave from this explosion that is propagating out at the speed of sound. There's also another shock wave coming out that is not going perhaps as fast as the speed of sound and that shock wave is on the ground. The ground is becoming almost liquid and behave like a liquid stuff and you see some very powerful waves rocking around in the ground and I'll come back to why this is important and why I know about this. But let's take a further look at it here. Now I'll play it again this video and you should note what is happening over here. Now a detonation happens right here. It starts to detonate over here. And now I'll wait for it. Now there was another detonation here and up here we have detonations. Here we have detonations. So new fires are starting all over the place. Now these fires get larger and larger and suddenly it, it, it creates new heavy booms. But I'll stop the video here because you've got enough information from this. What is happening is that the shock wave in the ground that makes these very rapid uh, movements, it could propagate at a speed of 100 or 200 kilometers per hour. And that means everything in the ground is rocked like that. That can, inside an ammunition drum, it can basically throw around all the ammunition at a rapid rate and it can make them detonate as well. Now, of course, an ammunition dump should have been built in order to avoid that kind of explosions. The engineers should have designed it so that wouldn't happen. But obviously we can see here that the explosions simply keep propagating into the other ammunition bunkers. They even said it could withstand nuclear attack. Yeah, definitely can't stand that. And maybe some corrupt generals took money in order to, yeah, just spend a whole lot less money building this site. Um, but that's how the Russian army is. It's corrupt and that's good for Ukraine, of course, because that makes it so much easier to destroy the Russian army. But let's move on. Now, the reason that I know that a big detonation will make the earth behave as a liquid with waves propagating out from the center of the explosion is that when I was in the army 30 years ago, I was trained how to behave if I was in a situation with bombardment from heavy artillery. And we were told to not lie flat on the ground because we were told that the shock waves that came from these explosions from heavy artillery would kill us. If we was lying flat down on the ground, the earth will simply push us up like with 100 or 200 kilometers per hour. And that would create internal bleedings in our stomach. It would crush our craniums in our head and basically kill us. So what did we have to do to survive this? Well, we had to fall down, obviously, because if you don't fall down, if you stand up and you are under bombardment, then you will die from sharpness, or you will die from fireballs coming towards you and burning you. So you need to fall down, but not lie flat on the ground. So what you do is you lie as in a position where you would be taking push-ups with your hands on your ground and then also your feet, having your body lifted like 40 centimeters or one feet above ground. So that these shock waves, when they come in the earth, your hands and legs will react like a spring and you will be saved because this earth hopefully would not be powerful enough to hit your body and your skull and then you could survive. So that's why I'm thinking that what we are seeing in this video is basically this earth shock wave propagating out and then starting all these fires all around. It's very consistent with what we see and the speed of this shock wave propagating out. It's not a whole lot of Ukrainian drones hitting everywhere at the same time. That's very unlikely. It's one drone that got through and started a chain reaction. That's what's happening. Now here we have a satellite image of this ammunition storage facility. And it has been mentioned elsewhere that it was spanning like 10 square kilometers. That would compare to like 5 kilometers on this way from here to here and 2 kilometers on the other side. That's 10 square kilometers. So these buildings we are seeing here, which is these storage uh, bunkers for ammunition, they are very large buildings. And we can also see here we have a, a, a village uh, side by also here. And all the dots we can see in that village well, they are private houses of people living there. So this is a really large facility. It stored, as I said, about 30,000 tons of ammunition. That's what it was designed to. But other satellite images I've seen, especially of this area here, show that also ammunition was stored outside of the bunkers. So maybe much more than 30,000 tons was stored here. 
And then I've seen other videos with how much has been destroyed of all these bunkers. And it turns out that about two thirds of all these bunkers looks like they are completely blown to pieces. That's a lot. And I can assure you that Ukraine didn't hit every one of these bunkers with a cruise missile. No, they hit a few, maybe one or two, and then the rest simply propagated out, as I just explained, with these shock waves that can move very fast and be very powerful, and they can make other ammunition stuff detonate if it's not built correctly. And here was obviously not built correctly. But Ukraine also destroyed two other large ammunition storage facilities in Russia as of late, and one of them was down here in Krasnodar in Rostov, and I took a measurement here on Deep State, how far that is away. It's 360 kilometers away from Ukraine. And it blew up right here. Let's take a look at a few images that we have from that. Here we have some satellite images from this facility. And it shows that ammunition is stored out in the open, at least in this part of the base. And we have some other satellite images from higher up that shows some of these bunkers that are built on this base. And here we have another one where it's stored in the open. And here, let me blow that up. Here we see how this is also exploding. So basically they hit this facility and it also starts to propagate and things starts to explode. So the same story. I don't think this facility was quite as large as the first one I showed you, but still. Let's take a look at another facility that Ukraine also hit. This is the second place that was also hit at the same day as this Krasnodar was hit that I just showed you. But also up here, another ammunition store was hit. And let's take a look at some of the footage from that attack. So here we are sitting inside a car driving at night and the passengers in this car are filming a fire that is burning at that ammunition storage. I don't think I want to play the video because maybe it's too dramatic for YouTube's algorithm. So I just want to give you some still images of what is happening. So this thing is burning and here it explodes. Uh, a much bigger explosion is happening but it was simmer burning in the beginning and then this happens just like a very very powerful thing and you can see here um, it doesn't look good it looks like a really powerful explosion so same thing as these other bases that we see it almost looked like a nuclear explosion going up there so yeah I think a lot of ammunition went off here and if there's any bunkers nearby I think also there's a good chance that it would have propagated just like we saw on the first base that was attacked by Ukraine. But let's move on with this video and discuss the weapons that Ukraine might have used for this attack. Now what weapons could it be that Ukraine have used for this? We know it cannot be Western weapons because these were deep strikes into Russia and no Western weapon has been approved for that yet, but I'm pretty sure it will be approved in a month or two. But right now Ukraine has a couple of different options that they can use to deep strikes into Russia. They have some propeller driven slow drones that they have built and that they have been using to target deep into Russia for the past one and a half year. But these are easy to shoot down with all kind of anti-aircraft systems, both missiles and also anti-aircraft guns, because they fly very slow. They only fly about 200 kilometers per hour. But as more of late, Ukraine has also introduced some new jet-powered weapons that are having the range that can attack these ammunition depots, but also has a much higher top speed, at least 400 kilometers per hour, making it really difficult for Russian anti-aircraft guns to shoot it down. Then it's only missiles that can shoot it down. And one of these weapons here is the Palinitsia weapon that was announced by Zelensky two months ago. It's pictured right here and I'll come back to it what it can do. And there's another weapon they have and it's this one called the Neptune missile. It's an anti-ship missile that Ukraine has used very successfully to sink the flagship of the Black Sea Moskva. But after they did that, Russia has pulled out of firing distance from this weapon. So what Ukraine has done is that they have made a new version of this Neptune missile that can be fired from land and attack other land target. It's basically a cruise missile. And I also made a video about that cruise missile where I go into the detail about what's that capable of. But everybody who follows my channel and have seen some of my videos know that I'm a big fan of organizing weapons that I bump into into a big Excel spreadsheet where I can list the key characteristics of the weapons and also do some calculations myself if I have to fill out some blanks that are not directly publicly available. So let's bring in that spreadsheet and take a closer look at what these weapons are capable of and why I think they have been used for these attacks. 
let's start with this weapon. This is the smallest of the jet powered weapons that Ukraine has developed. I have it right here highlighted in yellow this weapon. As we can see it entered service in 2024 January and it's a very affordable weapon only 40,000 US dollars I estimate and I have explained why I think that in the video I made about this weapon specifically so I'll not go into it here. But it's a 120 kilo heavy weapon of which 40 kilo is for the warhead and structure and 80 kilo is for fuel and it has a range of 500 kilometers meaning it can actually reach all of these ammunition depots that has been targeted by Ukraine and also has a speed of 430 kilometers per hour which is much higher than the previous weapons that Ukraine has used to strike Russia with, which are all listed down here. Here you can see the top speed of these weapons are like uh, 200 kilometers per hour, 200, 150 kilometers per hour, 140, 120, and 150. All these are Ukrainian made weapons that are super slow and that are also super easy to shoot down with simple anti-aircraft guns and also any missile, but you would use anti-aircraft guns because it's much cheaper way to down these weapons that doesn't cost a whole lot. So you wouldn't use super expensive anti-aircraft missiles on that. That can easily cost a million dollars each. But this weapon here, why do I think that Ukraine has used this for this attack? Well, it has a 20 kilo warhead, which if it is a blast fragmentation warhead, that's normally meant for killing infantry by blasting out a lot of tungsten bullets in all directions. But it could detonate those weapon cases that were lying out in the open that we just saw with these satellite pictures that Russians had been careless and storing weapons out in the open. They could be detonated by this weapon even with a blast fragmentation warhead. But I also think that this weapon is capable of penetrating a concrete reinforced bunker. How could it do that with a 20 kilo warhead? Well, it could use a shape-charged explosion that is also used to destroy tanks with. And I'll show you a video about how a much smaller warhead of only 3 kilo can penetrate 1 meter of armored steel using an anti-tank weapon. But this one is not 3 kilo, this is 20 kilo. So you should imagine that this weapon can be made 6 times more powerful than an anti-tank weapon that can take out a tank with 1 meter of armor. Let's go up and see this anti-tank weapon I was talking about. It's up here, it's called the Spike SR. It's an Israeli anti-tank weapon. It's only 10 kilo, the whole rocket. So let's take a look at how that looks. I'll play this video here, it's firing the rocket, it's being fired. Here we have a tank probably with a meter of armor on the side and it goes right in and detonate this tank and here we have another shot taking a look at that and it hits this tank here on the uh, on the turret and that's about it now it's quite incredible that a warhead that's only three kilo heavy how that can penetrate one meter of armor in a tank and several meters possibly of concrete. How is that possible with only three kilo warhead? It's possible because of this uh, shape charge. And I'll have this uh, illustration here that shows how it functions. Basically what we have is some dynamite. This is the warhead. We have some dynamite, that's the yellow stuff here. And then we have a liner of copper on the inside here. And then it's just hollow in the middle here. And then we have a detonator here that will ignite these explosions right here. And we have a trigger for the detonator that's sitting there. That one will be a sensor that will sense when this warhead should detonate. So when this one detonates, it ignites uh, the dynamite here that will then melt this uh, copper and basically press it together to a beam that is then propelled forward at an incredibly high speed, 28,000 kilometers per hour. That's the same speed that you want to send something in orbit around Earth. That's the same speed you have right there. And it's 28 times faster than the bullet of a pistol. And this copper here is the only thing that moves forward. And it's probably only 100 grams in a three kilo warhead. The rest is dynamite and just a shell and, and this detonator. But it comes flying forward at 28,000 kilometers per hour, 100 grams of this copper. It has a temperature of about 1,000 degrees Celsius when it detonates and flies forward. But then it will hit the tank, it will hit this armor, and of course it will slow down. And this kinetic energy of the copper will heat this copper further up and it will become a plasma at 4000 degrees. And then this plasma, you could say, bullet will burn itself through the armor 
all the way, actually only making a little entry hole, and then it will go all the way through this armor, and it will evaporate and create an explosion on the inside of the tank, basically because this copper is evaporating into copper steam that will kill everybody in the tank and also detonate the weapons that they have inside the tank. So that's how a small warhead can do this incredible thing of penetrating a tank. But of course this Palinicia weapon that has a 20 kilo warhead could do the same thing with 600 grams of copper lining inside this 20 kilo warhead that will then also have more dynamite to propel 600 grams of copper at the speed of 28,000 kilometers per hour forward towards a bunker. And then I think it will be able to penetrate easily like four or five meters of steel reinforced concrete. And all it has to do is to get inside the bunker, then this little bullet of uh, copper, all it needs to do is to hit one weapon and start a detonation in that weapon and then the whole thing will blow up. And that's why I think that Ukraine can use such a weapon also to blow up the biggest and most heavily reinforced bunkers that Russia has, even with this weapon. But let's take a look at the bigger weapon that Ukraine have. So just to repeat, the bigger weapon here looks like this. So this is the anti-ship weapon, Neptune. And that one has been converted into a cruise missile with some wings on. Let's bring the spreadsheet in to show this. Okay, so here we are with this spreadsheet. And I have the weapon down here, Palinicia Big, and I have two versions of it that I've calculated. They are exactly the same weight and the same speed. But what I've done for the first version is that I have a 300 blast fragmentation warhead that basically is some explosives that blast out a lot of tungsten bullets in all directions. And it could be detonated, say, 50 meter above an airfield with helicopters and airplanes and then it will create a lot of holes in these airplanes and helicopters. That's what this warhead would be really good for. However, it will not be able to penetrate a concrete reinforced bunker that Russia has built for their ammunition storage. Uh, for that, you would need a smaller warhead, like a 150 kilo warhead, that is then made the same way we make anti-tank weapons with a shaped charge that propels a copper liner into a beam of copper at extremely high speed, as I just explained. But if you have a 150 kilo warhead, then you can propel five kilo of molten copper at almost 30,000 kilometers an hour into a small beam that goes into this concrete bunker. And I guarantee you it can go through, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 meters of reinforced concrete. I don't think there's a bunker for storing ammunition that has walls that are thick enough to stop that weapon if Ukraine put that kind of warhead on the weapon. And all it has to do is to hit with that beam, hit one of the weapons that's stored inside this bunker and it will blow up from the inside. Uh, it will be a very powerful weapon. Another reason for reducing the weight of the warhead from 300 to 150 kilo is that then you can have 150 kilo more of jet fuel in this weapon and that will increase the range from 600 to 1035 kilometers. Before we take a look at the map to see what Ukraine can hit inside Russia, I like to bring some attention to another weapon in this table which is the JASM missile. Uh, that JASM missile, I made a video about that. We have a, a couple of versions of it right here, just highlighting them here. Um, that missile has also a dedicated bunker busting warhead, which is very different from what I have just described with a shaped charge. Um, this one is a 450 kilo warhead with only 120 kilo of explosives. Everything else, most of the weight is a steel capsule that will protect those explosives from detonating while it's penetrating a bunker, say seven meters of concrete, and then it can blow up with the explosives inside the bunker. Now, if you're hitting an ammunition depot, that's not really necessary because all the ammunition inside will blow up just fine. But if you're hitting a command bunker only with people inside, then really what you want to do is to bring some explosives into that bunker that then detonates and kill everybody inside that bunker. That's how the Americans like to do their weapons, and of course it can be used for a lot of things, but Ukraine don't have this weapon yet. They have this less heavy weapon, the Neptune missile here, and they can only carry, well, for a bunker-busting weapon, they can only carry about 150 kilo. They could make it even smaller and would still uh, be able to penetrate these bunkers, and then they could even get the range further up. But let's go back to the map to see what kind of ammunition storage facilities that Ukraine can hit with the bigger missiles here that they have. 
Now I found this source about the ammunition storage facilities that Russia has within striking range of Russia. Turns out they have six such facilities that are really large that store about 30,000 tons of ammunition. And these six here are within 750 kilometers range. Now this source also say that's for the Pelinitsia weapon. I don't think it has that much rain range. I've calculated detail and show how I did that calculation that it has 500 kilometers range. And I trust my own data better, uh, I must say. And I have described my method in a previous video. And I'm not going further into detail in this video. But I think the Neptune missile can have this range of 1,000 and almost 50 kilometers. So there will be additional storage facilities that this weapon can actually hit. Perhaps 10 of these depots and that will be a large fraction of Russia's 24 weapons depots that are of this size and that will be very good for Ukraine if they can destroy all of these and what is the chances that Ukraine can destroy all of these actually they're quite good because I got another news coming up here and this is this news here it says that the European Commission will provide Ukraine with a 35 billion dollar loan to support energy bomb shelters in schools domestically produce weaponry especially domestically produced weaponry that's a lot of money and let's take a look at how costly these weapons are and how much they could get for that kind of money let's go back to the spreadsheet so here with the Palinitsha Mini, it's only a $40,000 weapon. They could build 100,000 of these uh, weapons for only $4 billion. If we go down to this Neptune missile or Palinitsha Big, they could build 1,000 of those for a billion dollar. So I'm absolutely sure it's going to get a whole lot worse for Russia. They're going to lose all the ammunition stores in the next couple of months. But you can also see how much can Ukraine currently produce. I only think that Ukraine can, of this big cruise missile, and because of I'm following the war in Ukraine kind of closely, and I see how many of the attacks that could possibly be this long-range cruise missile that Ukraine has, and unfortunately, I don't think they have a production that's more than like 40 of these missiles per year. But I hope Ukraine can get it up to 300 and that they definitely can scale to that level. But to scale much beyond that, that'll be very hard for Ukraine. But with the other weapon, this Palinitsha Mini, it's much easier to produce. And also currently, I think they're making 300 per year, but they could easily scale that to 3,000 or even 30,000 per year. You can also see it's not really that it costs a whole lot. It can be produced in many localities in Ukraine because it's a much smaller weapon and it's much easier to make and that's why I think a lot more pain is coming for Russia because Ukraine has a production of weapon on their own that they will be able to use that doesn't mean that I don't think that the West and United States and Europe should not give Ukraine permission to use long-range weapons from the West absolutely we should give that permission to bring down, for instance, bridges in Russia, Ukraine will need this JASMS missile because it has this bunker-busting warhead that can penetrate inside the concrete and then blow up the concrete from the inside. That's perfect for bringing down bridges. And Ukraine doesn't currently have a weapon with a warhead that can do that. And that is also long range. And that means Ukraine need these JASMs to bombard all these Russian bridges that are, say, within 200 kilometers from the Ukrainian border. And then heavy weapons can't come in. Diesel for the Russian war machine cannot come in. And then they will lose. Then they only have knives and small arms to fight with. And that's not going to cut it in a modern war where Ukraine will have all the heavy weapons and the Russian soldiers will have no heavy weapons because they have no diesel to power their tanks or armored fighting vehicles. So we still need to bring some weapons to Ukraine. But I think now that my video is long enough, I hope you liked it. I'm going to make a lot more videos, especially if you support me with that donation button there that is so important for this channel. Then I can have much more time free to make these videos. And I have so many videos I'd love to make. So all I have to say now is have a great life in freedom and democracy. Goodbye.